Hello, my name is Farah and I'm the ES Arabic team lead and uh, an Arabic teacher in ASD. Thank you. So as a new uh, member uh, to the American School of Dubai community, um, it, it provides me with great um, grounding to refer to the mission and core values of the school. And in particular, as um, being involved in the World Languages Program at the school, I find these highlighted words to inspire each student to achieve their dreams and to become a passionate learner. And as these, this, these words um, will help all of our students to build their identity as global citizens and, and speaks to the opportunities that we at the American School of Dubai offer our students to build their, their identities as global citizens. <clears throat> so the agenda for today is, uh, we have uh, two goals. The first goal is to understand the basics of proficiency-based learning. We'll speak to what it is. We'll speak to why we have chosen it for the World Languages Programming and what it looks like in the classroom. And we'll speak to what the report cards look like. And throughout the, um, this, this webinar, uh, we invite you to post any questions that you have in the Q&A box. And um, Glenn Carlson will monitor the Q&A box and we will take some time at the end of the presentation to respond to, to any questions that pop up there. Oh. <laughs> and the, today's presentation is, is about the uh, proficiency-based um, reporting that we are using for world languages courses. So this is the Arabic world languages classes in elementary school and the, as well as middle and, high, well, middle and high school and the French and Spanish in middle school. Hi, um, so part of my job this morning is just to talk about the standards that we use and what uh, proficiency based grading is. Uh, I know that we've done a lot of work over the last few years on standards based grading and standards based learning systems. Um, but we always start with our standards and what are the standards that we use. Uh, we, we will and continue to use so they haven't changed. Uh, we use the, the actual um, standards for proficiency and they are actually already proficiency based. Uh, and the diagram the, that is shared uh, is really the one on the left. So novice low, novice mid, novice high, uh, then students move through intermediate levels, then advanced and superior. Um, in schooling, it's really unusual that students would get past an advanced low in K to 12 schooling, although very, very occasionally that would happen. Um, but I think that in the beginning, it's important that you understand that they, the, I guess the way that these standards flow and also just the shape of the diagram. So we look at novice low, novice, uh, all those novice, um, I guess, proficiency levels. They, we start off with just listing words. And so we move from that quite quickly, except in the very younger years. Uh, whereas if we're in intermediate mid or intermediate high, you can see that, that the area or volume within that diagram is actually a lot bigger. And so it takes longer for students to get through those proficiency levels. And sometimes it can take, uh, sometimes it's very normal for a student to, to take two years in one of those proficiency levels. So even though I'm just going to draw your attention to the right hand side where we're going to use a ladder, we're going to actually use this ladder um, as uh, as a diagram to help you understand uh, what we're doing in terms of the grading. But just keep in mind that it is actually a picture that looks a lot more like the diagram on the left hand side, just because of the difference in content. So we're just going to squeeze that out and make it a nice simple ladder for the rest of today. Um, so if you could move to the next slide, please, Sherry. Uh, no, oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so proficiency, go back one. That's okay. Uh, if you use your arrows down the bottom, you should be able to do the same thing. Yeah, it's just not being so responsive. Okay, so, so proficiency-based learning <laughs> is really, um, it's, it's very similar. We use the same actual standards that we use right now, uh, where, but it's just a small evolution in instead of, uh, let's not say instead of right now, um, but really it's about making sure that all of those targets so that each step on that ladder 
is really, really clear to you. You can see it before you go up it. You can see where it is and you know that you need to get to that step before you get to the next one. And so proficiency-based learning is really just making sure that all of those steps are clearly articulated and that the focusing is on teaching towards the next step and the next step and the next step. And if you could change slides. So what we have now is a system where we have those same standards and if you look at the, the rung on that ladder that says proficient. So right now, if you are there in terms of your growth in world language, you are graded as proficient. And that works for English or math or any other subject as well. Uh, if you're a step below that, then you're adequate. If you're a step below that, you're limited. And anything above proficient, we grade as exemplary. Uh, so we have uh, we have that same ladder, but we say exactly what proficient means in that particular course. And that's how we grade with standards-based learning. So we're actually shifting from that to a proficiency-based learning system for world languages. And proficiency-based is that all of those steps are available as choices when we're talking about learning for each child. And then we're going to talk, and then if you are a step four, we will say you're a step four and this is what it looks like. If you're a step five, this is what it looks like. If you're a step six, this is what it looks like. So instead of saying this is what passing is, we're actually telling you what your student and we're telling students what they are and able, are not able to do at that point in time in terms of their growth in that particular area. So what does this look like in terms of the, the actual standards? Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So let's say that your child is in a novice high class this year. So the target, uh, if you look up above, uh, you'll see that standards based in a standards based system to get proficient, uh, you, that child would have to use complete sentences and, and be able to use memorized questions. So uh, how old are you? Um, <laughs> how, what is the weather like? You can learn those, those sentences and you can parrot those back. Uh, and you're starting to use complete sentences. If you're able to do that, right now, we say that that's proficient if you're in a novice high class. What we're moving to is we know that even within a novice high class, uh, with the way that we group students, there are some answers that a student might give uh, that might just be one word. And so that would, even though they might be operating at a novice high level, the answer might be a novice low answer. And so where with proficiency based learning, we're actually showing students what they need to do to be able to demonstrate different levels of proficiency along the <coughs> scale or the ladder um, that has been being used for the last six years at ASD. If you go to the next slide. So again, this is what the report card kind of looked like in the past. Uh, we had interpersonal communication, interpretive listening, interpretive reading. These were the, the areas that children or students were graded against. And so at certain points, they were said proficient in that novice high class. That would mean that this child was operating at a proficient level. Whereas what we're moving and anything that was above proficient was graded as just exemplary. Um, if we, whereas now, if we go to the proficiency based slide, we're really saying that this child in this particular area is operating at an intermediate low level. And that means that the student, and that will give a list of what that student is able to do within that area at any point in time. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about why that's useful, but just in terms just this really, the, the idea is that students will know what they are and, able, and are not able to do. You will have a really clear picture of what they're able to do. Um, you'll also notice that our courses this year, uh, even in middle, even in high school, are named with the proficiency level so that you're able to see about what level your child should be performing at if they're in that class. And we're giving direct feedback against, so the, against the same scale. So our courses are named within this scale. The assessments are created within this scale. The feedback is created within this scale and the report is, create, is also uh, tied to the same scale. So really this is a, a, a jump to using a consistent language and giving really, really detailed feedback to students um, and to parents so that you're able to know where your child is and what's the next step on that ladder. And really it's just as simple as that. 
And so this visual uh, speaks a little more concretely to why it's important to understand the levels of proficiency. Um, with this uh, metaphor, this analogy of swimming, we can clearly see um, the skills and the development of skills and what the student needs to do next to move to the next level of, uh, of being a strong swimmer. In the picture in the top left, um, a beginning swimmer just learning comfort with the water needs the support of the adult. We can see that this child needs to learn to put her face in the water, strengthen, you know, learn how to kick, use her arms. Mm -hmm. And as we progress around that the images clearly indicate um, when you know what it is that you need to, to be able to do to move to the next level of proficiency, it's easier to hit that target. Um, and it's easier as educators to, to facilitate and to coach and to provide the learning environment where students can hit those targets. Another image of, uh, of the progression of proficiency from, from uh, you, you know, using trainers with trainer wheels um, all the way through to trick jumping on your bicycle. So why have we chosen a proficiency-based reporting for ASD? Um, for the students, it enhances student learning. There's an emphasis on the communicative strengths of the students, what they can do in the language and then what they need, uh, making visible to them, what are their next steps to, to uh, build their, their skills in any particular mode of communication. Proficiency-based reporting builds on underlying, underlying communicative proficiencies that students bring to language learning. They have skills in listening and they have skills in reading in their, in their home languages. They have um, basic strategies for, for speaking and writing and interpersonal communication. So have, taking this approach builds on underlying um, synapses and brain structures that they have to for um, for language learning and the last one it, it enables students to be um, has student ages to take control of their own learning to a certain extent for teachers oh i must <laughs> apologize my screen is quite sensitive um, for teachers in programming, it provides clarity. Having the framework provides clarity uh, for teachers to set learning targets for the, the lesson, the week, the day, um, and to facilitate the language learning. And with the, the feedback portion and the reflective portion, it allows teachers to, to, and students to reframe um, if, if something has not been achieved that week, then the teacher may use that inform will use that information to to reframe. How do I reframe that learning target? What learning practices do I need to bring to the students to offer them a different opportunity to learn and demonstrate learning? And in terms of a global context, there's a global and increased acknowledgement globally <clears throat> of the understanding of levels of language learning. So while we use uh, the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, ACTFL, proficiency standards, there are other standards out there, a common European framework of reference, for example. And um, more and more colleges and universities and workplaces understand uh, when, when a student comes to them and says that they're an advanced low <clears throat> in French, it provides a clear indication of what that student can do or that that person can do in that language. So it's, there's a, a much more global recognition of language learning and understanding of, of the levels. Uh, I, I'm coming from Canada and I know that in Canada when students um, apply to, to universities, they, and they say that, um, that they're a level B1 or a B2, it offers them um, advanced placement in certain courses because colleges and universities understand this student can already do this, they need to be in this level course. Okay, well, um, for me as a classroom teacher, the most valuable aspect of the proficiency based learning is that makes the process of acquiring a language visible to my students. Each step of the ladder, as you can see on the um, on the image. Um, describes what the students can do with the language, referring to the different aspects of learning a language. If, for example, we look at the novice high um, step, 
um, the first strand talks about the complexity of the language, speaks in phrases. The second strand talks about the, uh, uh, um, the range of vocabulary, speaks, uh, speech is still limited to memorized materials. And then the last strand talks about the functions of the language. By becoming aware of what language involves, students are becoming more independent and becoming um, increasingly aware of where they are on that ladder. Um, they are able to track their own progress through, uh, through, through the ladder and gain a clear understanding of how to move to the next level and also set goals for themselves. Um, for example, if we look at the first strand, which talks about the complexity of the language in a novice myth, it would be speaks in lists. So that means like a simple um, pieces of vocabulary. In a novice high, this is already speaks in phrases. Uh, intermediate law, talks, it, it's already students are able to uh, form sentences. And intermediate mid, uh, they're starting to create with the language. So students, so if we look, for example, at the bottom, um, uh, those are kind of support scaffolding for students how they uh, how they can set their own targets or oh, to move for example to move from a novice mid well I have uh, from a, from a novice mid to novice high I start to have to put my center my words into phrases and then those phrases into uh, into sentences um, in class we also um, discuss how those descriptors translate for each assignment, what, what are the specific, uh, what is the specific vocabulary, the specific structures they need to use for each assignment in order to be successful. And in this way, we are creating an environment of transparency of the learning process. Um, students are able to identify their strengths as language learners and also identify um, areas for improvement. This gives them an ownership of the learning process and makes them more independent and able to regulate, to kind of self-regulate their own learning. Um, I love hearing when students speak in a very articulate way um, about where they are on their uh, language learning journey and they know what they have to do in order to progress further. Thank you. Sorry, Farah. <laughs> there we go. So um, I'm going to be speaking also about uh, proficiency in ES. How does it look like from a teacher's perspective? Well, the teacher is uh, using the proficiency-based approach. Teacher as ide uh, identifies what the students can do independently, referring to the four modes of communication, and guides the students respectively. Meanwhile, in a standard-based ap approach, after the teacher has shared the standards with the students, the student's work is compared to those standards, and uh, the student uh, is being uh, either, either meets proficiently, partially, or minimally. Whereas in a proficiency-based approach, students are able to identify what they can do uh, in, uh, with the language and what they need to do to move further. Um, how does a teacher communicate in elementary school this to the students, taking into consideration their age and maturity level? Well, charts like the one shared with you on the slides and visuals are used to uh, support this process. Guiding questions and activities um, are also being uh, practiced with the students. Um, what, it, what each scoop on the ice cream cone, their language ice cream cone looks like, what does it mean? How does it translate into proficiency? Is being uh, discussed with the students and they, uh, through activities and fun activities, actually. So, um, for example, um, this, sim this uh, simple ice cream cone that talks about prof proficiency is being the empty one is being shared with the students. They color where they are now and where they want to be. And then uh, each assignment 
ties to those uh, proficiency levels and the students are being supported with con sentence connectors, um, functions that can help them add up uh, on their cone as they uh, progress in the language. And so um, um, it's, it is very, very common to uh, see and hear a child saying that I'm going to try to be speaking in sentences. I'm going to challenge myself to ask a question. And so as they do that, they are now as they uh, as we have represented it this way to them, they're now able to know where they are and where they want to go and how to do that as well. Thank you. <clears throat> so the elementary report, and we have two models, and, and these are mock-ups um, because of the change. We're not, and um, we don't have a full model for you yet. But the, the change, the elementary report card for Arabic will look like this: the teacher's name at the top. The student, the teachers will still uh, have an assessment of the social and work habits, and then the five modes of communication: interpretive listening, reading, communication, speaking, and writing. And then there will be an indication of what the student can do, the level that they have demonstrated um, for in that reporting period, and what the student can do. So in presentational speaking, for example, um, this particular student can present information about themselves and some other very familiar topics using a variety of words and phrases and memorized expressions. And then there will be a, a comment, short comment um, following and those descriptors. For middle school, uh, the report card will look like this. To continue to comment on or continue to assess the learner development profile and then the, the modes of communication and an indication of the level the student is working at um, and the descriptor of what the student can do in that language. So at this point, we'd like to uh, return to your questions that Mr. Carlson has been moderating. Hi, yeah. Um, so I'm just going through. Uh, okay, I'm just going through some of the questions. Um, oh, and hi, I just closed my little camera thing there. Um, so a couple, there were a couple of questions about native Arabic and how this is separate. And so just want to clarify that native Arabic um, is, is a literature course. It's not an ac a language acquisition course. It's a, a course that's the Arabic equivalent of an English language arts course. And so those standards uh, that we use are the QRTA or the Ministry of Education standards. They're very, very tight. Uh, they're very tightly tied uh, to the um, English language arts common core standards that we use. Uh, and therefore, they're taught in a very similar way and they're assessed in a very similar way to our English language arts classes. Um, the world language standards that we use are actually created around a proficiency scale, which is why we've evolved our, our assessment to match uh, the proficiency scale that they have used. We have seen a bit of a disconnect between the standards-based reporting versus the, um, the using a proficiency scale like this because the standards are not designed that way. Uh, so really, that's one of the main uh, reasons why we have moved in this direction. Um, it was planned, uh, but it just takes a few years to kind of put into practice. Uh, even technically with PowerSchool, it's taken about a year and a half for them to be able to do what we're asking them to do, believe it or not. Uh, so yeah, we're really excited about that. Um, and that is the reason why at Native Arabic, this doesn't apply to them. Um, I do see, so also for those of you who um, who are new to the school or maybe not new to the school, you'll also see that we've changed our leadership structure around, lang around world language and languages this year. Uh, last year we had a director of, of Arabic. This year we actually have a director of language, uh, which includes all languages, including English language arts. And Sherry's joining us with her vast experience in this area, including, um, including immersion schools and bilingual schools, um, so that we're able to really see and move towards that development um, of 
parity between our native courses and non-native uh, course, uh, sorry, native course in Arabic, as well as our native course in English language arts. So it's a journey that we're going on. Um, I can see that there are a couple of questions about that and you'll see some more information and, and some invitations to, uh, to be able to get more information about where we're going um, over the coming couple of months. Um, I'm looking at another question with an example. Um, uh, the question is, this is great and long overdue. How do you plan on using this framework to personalize the learning for each student? Can you demonstrate this through an example? I wonder, Gregana, would you mind? <laughs> Sorry, I know that you just pushed your chair back. Would you be able to give an example for that one? That you're on mute. Yes. Oh, hello. Um, uh, of course. So um, we, um, the way we, uh, we personalize the learning is through designing the tasks which are more open-ended so they can cater for those differences. Well, the first, uh, probably I should start that for me, this framework really helps me uh, being able to identify and diagnose more accurately the, the, the ranges of ability in my classrooms. And once I have, um, as, we, as, as Glenn explained before, before, before we had only four steps, well now in one class, even though it's, it's named uh, intermediate mid-class, I might have students who are ranging from um, from a novice to, intermi uh, to, uh, to intermediate meet or high, depending on their previous experiences of learning, of learning the language. So first of all, I can diagnose those differences and then I'll be open, uh, able to design uh, tasks and units where students can demonstrate this range of uh, range of abilities, the approaches which we use are competences, uh, competence-based learning, project-based learning, which students really uh, where the questions are not closed. They don't target only one level, but uh, they um, spiral, and students will be able to operate at the level which they are and to show to demonstrate the knowledge of, uh, uh, of which they have of the of the language i hope that that answers your question sherry i wonder if you could go back to that slide with the the part of the rubric on it um that might be able to help with that yes uh, go one one more back <clears throat> uh sorry no a uh, couple more that one. Um, so I can imagine, Gurgana, that if a, you know, you ask a question in class and a student was giving, you know, they were answering with one word, you'd be able to say, yeah, that's great. Um, so you're in a novice high class. So how would you do that at a novice? What would be a novice high answer instead of a novice low answer? And mm -hmm. so we're, getting, we're really pushing students to be able to, to, I guess, dance on the edge of what they are and are not able to do and be able to challenge students at that kind of level to be able to, to push themselves harder and, and give answers that are demonstrative of the level that they're operating on. Exactly. And I think that for those of you who've been here for a while, last year because of the situation that we were in with school not being on, we couldn't give Apple testing. Uh, we do some standardized testing uh, where students have to are being recorded on a computer uh, answers to certain questions. And what we, we often find that this is also in line with that, where a student is asked, you know, what time do you go to bed? And they'll say eight o'clock. And that's, that's not demonstrating the full range of what they're able to do at a level of complexity. And so they end up, you know, when the results come back, they've only given novice low, novice mid types of answers and potentially they're rated at a lower level than what we're seeing in class uh, because of that. And that's very, very typical, especially uh, with, uh, as you get into the upper ends of middle school, uh, especially in lower ends of high school, that we end up with a lot of, a bit of a mismatch in some of our results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just looking at more questions. Um, there's more questions about a, uh, native. 
Arabic, which we're not going to answer right now because this is that's not the focus of this. Um, but I do see that there's a need, uh, and we'll 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 have a discussion about what that means. Um, will you group the students according to their level at grade at grade three? Uh, yeah, we already do slightly. Um, we normally do. This year we haven't been able to because of the government requirements on how students are grouped and the because we're trying to stop as much as possible students mixing we were unable to do that uh, in normal years yes we do do that um, this year the government has said that we have to keep students within the one class and they're not allowed to mix you'll this is a COVID related activity but normally yes we would um, we do uh, ability group in even in elementary school um, and I don't see any more questions. Oh, uh, except for one, which is about, um, will native Arabic students have a chance to take a second language in middle and high school? Sherry, you might want to, do you want to answer yes. that? Uh, you're new, so I don't know whether you know enough to ask that. <laughs> uh, I've understood that, that yes, um, when students uh, are taking native Arabic, they, will, they also have the option in middle school to take a French or a Spanish. And that is certainly something that we would continue to support. Yeah. And, and same goes in high school. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think our graduation requirements are 24 credits and there's a possible 32. So there's a lot of extra room to be able to, to really deal. And that doesn't even count the, um, the elective. So there's lots of room for students who are really turned on by, by learning world languages to be able to really explore that passion as they go through. And I'm sure that this team in particular would, um, would be supportive of that. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I think we're kind of coming to the end. Uh, there's not many more questions. Um, so thank you very much um, for all of the, for your attendance um, and your interest in the school and interest in our world language program. Uh, we really appreciate you giving up some of your time. Uh, this session is being recorded. Uh, so if there's people who have any questions about this, please, th please throw them that way uh, to the recording. Uh, it's always on our YouTube channel. So we're completely able to, to give those details. Um, and if you have any questions at all, the first point of call is always your child's teacher. Um, they'd be really willing to, to sit down and explain any of this. And also ask your child because they should be beginning to understand this as well. So I would also like to uh, express my gratitude to the, the panel for presenting this morning and, and to you for your interest in being here. And um, be, be assured we will um, look at those questions that you have around Arabic native language. And please look for more sessions and more opportunities throughout this year to, as we continue to, to grow and learn together to strengthen the language programming here at ASD. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I think we're going to end the session. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.